Hello and welcome to today's lecture in the course Image Analysis and Interpretation. And today we will talk about density estimation and also about clustering because uh, these two things are related to each other. And I will start uh, with an example, the same example as for the last lecture. And as you remember, our task was to classify each pixel into one of two land, uh, land cover classes, either arable land or desert. And for this, we use the features red, green and blue. And uh, for classification, uh, because we want to do a supervised classification, we need reference data and we can collect those reference data. Um, for example, by creating an additional image, something like this here. Um, so you have an additional image as the same size as the uh, observational image you have. And you annotate, you annotate specific areas in this image with distinct colors so that you can distinguish between these two uh, classes. And then you mark in the image areas where you are sure that you have specific areas. Of course, this is all, uh, only one possibility to do this. You can also ask experts to do this, or you can perform in situ, in situ measurements where you directly have coordinates and with the coordinates you can relate to um, yeah, the position in the image. But uh, here you, um, yeah, you have the coordinates because you have the same size of the image, so you can directly assign um, the annotation to uh, the features and therefore you have feature label pairs which you can use for training and for testing. So in the last lecture we also had a look at the Bayes theorem and especially as uh, at the likelihood function. So the Bayes theorem is used uh, for maximum likelihood and maximum a posteriori uh, classification. So this is based on this. And one part of the Bayes theorem is the likelihood function. The likelihood function uh, is a function which you determine for each class. And uh, you, yeah, for, the, for the estimation, you use uh, all the features you collected uh, for each class. And um, we assumed in the last lecture that we have a Gaussian distribution of our data. So our likelihood function uh, was a Gaussian function. Um, that means we have a Gaussian distribution for each class and the parameters which describe the distribution are determined from the da training data for each class. Um, and uh, I illustrated it like this. Uh, remember we had uh, the three features, red, green and blue. And if we put this in a, in a feature space, so the, uh, uh, the red points indicating uh, where the features of agriculture, uh, the agriculture areas are, and the blue points indicate where all the features of the desert lie in feature space. Um, and because we assumed the Gaussian distribution, we use for illustration these, these yellow ellipsoids. And these yellow ellipsoids are the one sigma ISO surfaces of the Gaussian distribution. And they illustrate how the data is distributed. In the next slide, I want to show you how the covariance matrix, which describes um, a Gaussian distribution, and an ellipse, which uh, illustrates the Gaussian distribution, how they are related. And um, how they are related is summarized on the slide. So first of all, um, I want to repeat that the Gaussian distribution is parameterized by the mean vector and the covariance matrix. So in the gray box, you can see how uh, the mean is computed and also the covariance matrix, how um, it is computed. And for now, let's assume we have a mean vector of zeros. And in uh, two dimensions, the covariance matrix is a two times two dimensional matrix. On the diagonal, you have the variances and on the, uh, yeah, the other elements are the covariances. And because the covariance matrix is symmetric, you can say the sigma 1, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 1. And um, so let's have a look at the, at the ellipse. So an ellipse is parameterized by a few um, parameters, which uh, is the major 
uh, axis, the minor axis, and um, an angle theta. And we denote the major axis as the square root of lambda 1 and the minor axis as square root of lambda 2. And the angle is denoted as theta. And the major axis and the minor axis uh, indicate the largest spread and they are perpendicular to each other. If you would have more dimensions than two, you would have an um, ellipsoid. So you have more um, axes. Uh, and, but still, they are all perpendicular to each other and they all indicate the direction of the largest spread. So theta is, the, is an angle in radians um, and you, um, it starts, or the angle starts from the positive x-axis uh, and goes onto the ellipse major axis uh, in counterclockwise direction. And um, if you now have a look at the covariance matrix, uh, you can um, relate the parameters of the ellipse and uh, yeah, the elements of the covariance matrix to each other. And how this is done is summarized on the slide. And you can see um, when you have a look at lambda 1 and lambda 2, um, all what you need are the variances and yeah, the covariance. And also for theta, uh, you can compute it, but here you need to uh, distinguish between a few cases. And another interesting thing is that you can do eigenvalue decomposition. So eigenvalue decomposition can be performed on the covariance matrix and uh, it will give you eigenvalues and uh, the eigenvectors. And the interesting thing is that the, the, eigen, um, uh, the eigenvalues can, uh, are proportional to the length of the axis and uh, eigenvectors will give you the direction of the axis. And this is a tool uh, which you can use for um, yeah, some um, some applications, for example, for dimensionality reduction. Imagine you have high dimensional data and you have you um, compute a covariance matrix and you perform eigenvalue decomposition on this covariance matrix. You can exactly identify the direction in high dimension where the spread is very low. So there where not a lot of things are happening. So and these are exactly the direction you can get rid of. And uh, if you get rid of all these uh, directions, which do not give you some information, you can re reduce the dimension. And this is actually the idea behind principal component analysis. But for now, um, you know um, how you can um, yeah, uh, draw an ellipse or illustrate a Gaussian distribution when you have given a covariance matrix. And um, so, as I already showed you in the in the last lecture, uh, when we um, do a, um, or perform a maximum likelihood classifier, if we use the classifier and get a maximum likelihood estimate, you compute uh, we compute the uh, the likelihood function values for both classes, arable land and desert. And if you do this for all pixels, um, you can get the two plots on the right side. Uh, where bright means a high probability and dark means a low probability. And if you take uh, the argument of the maximum, you can uh, um, obtain such a classification map um, where you just in the end look where the value is higher in the likelihood uh, function values. So for this example, we assume that our data is Gaussian distributed, but um, this is not always the case, uh, so it's not always a good decision that you um, um, say that your data is Gaussian distributed because not everything in the world is Gaussian distributed. Um, and you need to be aware that the, the choice of the distribution is crucial for the classification success um, because if you, um, made, um, if you make a bad decision on how your data is distributed, you will have a uh, not so good defined likelihood function and then uh, you might get a, a low classification uh, accuracy. The problem is that often you do not know how your data is um, distributed, especially when you have high dimensional features and you cannot have an, um, a direct look uh, into the feature space. 
Um, also, imagine you would not only have um, um, green arable land in our in our example, but a very uh, also very bright beige um, arable land, so brighter than the desert. Then, uh, a Gaussian distribution would not be the best choice to describe um, your data, because um, you would have actually two classes in feature space, and in the middle you would have um, yeah the other class. So one Gaussian distribution would not be enough. Um, also, besides the choice, the estimate is also important. So if you have uh, one Gaussian distribution, it's, it's uh, okay, it's fine. You can compute the mean and the covariance matrix. But I will show you today that if you have more complex distribution, you need a suitable approach to determine the parameters uh, of this more complex distribution. So generally, what you have given are the data points. And the task is now to model a probability density function. And this uh, whole process is called density estimation. And generally, the problem is ill posed. What does it mean? Um, you have an infinite amount of density function from which the data could have been sampled. And here the keyword is sampled because you never have all data or nearly never have all data. Um, you only have samples from it. So when you make an observation, um, you have um, um, these observations are just samples from a distribution which, for example, describes land cover classes as forest or, um, or water or something like this. And, but any function that is not zero at the data points is possible. And for this, let me show you one example. Um, you have given a few samples. The, the samples stem from some observation process and uh, you need to be aware that maybe the observation process was not um, very comprehensive, so you just only have a few samples. And um, I guess you agree with me that this distribution might not be a good representation of your data, but it might be this distribution could be a good um, um, representation of the data, but also this distribution and also this distribution. And all these uh, they are all uh, Gaussian distributions and uh, they are all defined by different covariance metrics and different means, but still there would be possible um, distributions to represent this kind of data. Um, it's very important, so, um, uh, so when you think about this, it's very important that you think about the training data collection process because um, as you can be seen here, it's good um, when you collect training data to get a, a, a wide variety of the training data samples so that you have a chance to uh, uh, later uh, estimate a representative distribution of your data. And um, let's go back to the Gaussian distribution. And uh, let's have a look at the so-called multivariate Gaussian distribution. In statistics, the multivariate uh, distribution is a uh, generalization of a one-dimensional distribution to higher dimensions. So if you have more than two dimensions, that means in this case, uh, D is larger than one, you have a multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution. And this uh, distribution, as uh, mentioned already, is uh, parameterized by the mean and the covariance matrix, where the mean has the dimension of uh, D, and the covariance matrix has a dimension of d times d. And as I mentioned, um, it, uh, in many cases, it's not enough to, um, yeah, to assume that your data is Gaussian distributed with one multivariate Gaussian distribution. And uh, if you have a look at, for example, these data samples, uh, I hope you agree with me that here, one Gaussian distribution might not be uh, good um, yeah, to represent the data. And this is where you need a multimodal distribution. A multimodal distribution is a probability distribution with more than one peak. And that means the peak is one mode. So um, the mode can be seen as a local maximum of the density. 
So let's talk a little bit more about multimodal distributions. And a multimodal Gaussian distribution is also called the mixture of Gaussians. And the mixture of Gaussians is nothing else than a weighted mean of Gaussian distributions. And the equation is illustrated here. So what you have is you have a lot of Gaussian distributions uh, denoted with n. Uh, parameterized by the mean and the covariance matrix and then you have uh, pi as uh, mixing coefficients and these uh, mixing coefficients pi can be considered as probabilities that the feature was sampled from a specific mixture component so one Gaussian distribution is one mixture component and um, they can be considered as a probability because they, uh, if you take all the mixture components, they sum to one. And also each of the component is between one and zero, um, between zero and one, this direction. Okay, um, so let's have a, a deeper look at this and assume um, we have an example and we have given three different uh, distribution that, uh, that means three different of these mixing components. And now um, we sample points from it and each point is sampled from one of these three different distribution, but we don't know from which one. And uh, on the left side, you would exactly, uh, or you see how it would look like if we would have this information uh, when um, yeah, know from which distribution the points are sampled and you see red, yellow and a, uh, a blue cluster, which could be three uh, Gaussian distributions. But uh, this is generally unknown to us because when you observe something, uh, nobody tells you uh, how the data is uh, distributed or maybe somebody tells it to you, but generally nobody has this information. So what you get is um, looks like something in the middle. And uh, what you get is a uh, marginal distribution. So you have no information about um, uh, the mixture component. So it's, uh, we were already talking about this marginalization process in the, um, in the last lecture. In the last lecture, it was in the context of the Bayes theorem where we were marginalizing out the, um, the classes, but here, um, you, we have no information about the mixture component, so it's a, um, yeah, we are marginalizing out uh, the mixture component. So this is the, um, yeah, the information you get, just the samples, no information about this distribution. And on the right side, you see what you can actually estimate. So um, what you can estimate is the soft assignment of the samples. Uh, in case you have an, uh, you make an assumption that there are three mixture components and you have a good algorithm to, um, yeah, to estimate the parameters of th these three mixture components, then you can make a soft assignment. And how you all can do this, we will talk about in today's lecture. Um, yeah, so let's go back to our likelihood function. So this is where I started. You, you want uh, a good likelihood function and here one Gaussian distribution might not be enough. So you um, can ask your question, how can we use such a mixture as a likelihood function? And remember, we have only given the sample, so no information about the distribution, um, the underlying true distribution and we can use a so-called expectation maximization algorithm and um, to determine these mixture components and expectation maximization algorithm is a general method for finding the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters of the underlying distribution. In other words, expectation maximization finds the model parameters that maximize the sum of all likelihood function values of the given data. And um, remember when I uh, showed you the different distribution which could represent uh, the data, um, expectation maximization is a way that uh, given the data, it finds um, distributions, mixture of distributions, which would maximize all the likelihood function values um, um, yeah, of the data given these distribution parameters. 
And in case of Gaussian distributions, the parameters are the means and the covariance matrices. And now you also have the mixing coefficients because you have weighted some of these Gaussian distributions. And expectation maximization is an iterative procedure which estimates the parameters similar to k-means. So k-means you already know, uh, I showed you in the context of clustering and image segmentation. And in the end of the lecture, of today's lecture, you will see that all this is connected. So once you know something about clustering, you also already know something about density estimation, and then you can also, you also know something about image segmentation and so on. So it's, um, Imagine this as you have a toolbox uh, of different uh, tools and uh, you can combine them in different way to, um, yeah, to solve specific tasks. So let's talk a little bit more about the EM algorithm. Um, before we start, we need to, uh, we need to make some pre uh, preliminary considerations and we need to think about which distribution I was talking about Gaussian distribution so far, but nobody tells you that you need uh, to uh, use a Gaussian distribution. There are also other distributions you could use. And how many mixing coefficients? So in the end, you uh, need to know, or you need to decide on how many um, uh, mixture components you want to have in your mixture uh, of distributions. And um, the EM algorithm is performed independently for all classes. So um, if you assume two mixture components for class one, uh, you can assume more or less mixture components for, this, uh, for the other classes. And um, for the next slide, we omit the class index K because we ha already have a few in indices. Um, so uh, just keep in mind that uh, what we what I explained in the next slide uh, will be done for all classes independently. And so let's start. So EM algorithm is very similar to k-means uh, cluster algorithm. And um, so we start again with an initialization. And um, because it's an iterative process, you need uh, quite a good initialization. So be careful with it. Um, <clears throat> and so for now, let's assume you uh, take two mixture component. That means uh, you choose two arbitrary centroids, uh, two cluster means and two covariance matrices. And if you do not know anything, uh, you can assume, for example, equal variances. And uh, this is illustrated with this uh, blue and the red circle. And in the middle of the circle, this is the mean. And yeah, these circles are the ellipses illustrating exactly the covariance matrix as I showed you before. And the first step is the E step, the expectation step. And in the expectation step, you softly assign a feature vectors to the mixture components. Um, that means uh, you, um, it's not that you assign one point only to one, um, yeah, to, uh, only to one uh, cluster or one component. Here you um, uh, compute a soft assignment to each of these two components. In the M step, uh, this is the maximization step, you re-estimate the parameters for each mixture component based on the soft assignment. So here what you do is you compute a new mean as for uh, uh, as for k-means, but now you also recompute uh, the covariance matrices. And um, this is illustrated here. And you repeat these two steps until convergence. Now you uh, also see why it's called expectation maximization step because uh, um, algorithm, because you have two steps, the E step and the M step. And actually you will find this principle of expectation and maximization in many areas uh, in machine learning and computer vision. Um, so this would be the final result. If you have a few iterations, uh, in the end, you uh, end up with two clusters and um, yeah, you have uh, two components and each of the co uh, components has a mean and a, 
covariance matrix representing exactly this cluster. So to make it a little bit more formal, let's put uh, the uh, expectation uh, maximization procedure into a few equations. And for this, we start with the E step. So in the E step, you softly assign the data points to the mixing components and you can do it uh, with the following equations. And what is in the equation is that you have um, uh, N, which is the Gaussian distribution parameterized by the mean and the covariance matrix. And here you can plug in some other distribution um, if, if you like. And uh, you also have pi, which are the mixing coefficients. And remember the mixing coefficients are all in between zero and one and they sum to one. And if you have no good idea how to initialize them, you can assume all mixing components have the same value. And uh, these uh, soft assignments uh, are denoted with A. And you do this for each uh, data point, for each feature vector in the feature space. And this is similar to k uh, means, but here you consider also a class dependent covariance matrix uh, and also the mixing coefficients. So for k-means, um, you just uh, made an assignment to uh, one of the clusters and here you make a soft assignment to all of these mixture components. So let's continue, uh, continue with the M step. In the M step, you re-estimate the parameters for each mixture component based on the soft assignments. So A were the soft assignments. Now I also introduced an I as an upper index, which uh, indicates the iteration. And um, so you can, uh, what you do in the M step is you compute a new uh, mean, a new covariance matrix for each component, and also new mixture, um, yeah, mixture components. And um, uh, for example, for the mean, the features vectors are weighted by these uh, soft assignments, these membership probabilities for each uh, mixture component. And uh, also for the mean and the covariance matrix, you have a factor in front of it. And here you have uh, one divided by the sum over all these soft assignments. And uh, for the mixture components, uh, you, uh, what you do here is you sum over all these soft assignments and then you divide by the number um, of all samples. So in this case, uh, you have in, in this iteration, you can recompute all these parameters you need and then you go back to the E step, have new soft assignments and so on until convergence and convergence can be, for example, um, uh, the, uh, the parameters do not change that uh, much anymore or um, yeah, or, or uh, the uh, soft assignments might not change uh, that much anymore. So in the end you can decide uh, when you want to stop or you just choose a fixed number of iterations. So let's talk a little bit more about the properties of such Gaussian mixture models and also how uh, what uh, are the advantages and disadvantages of expectation maximization and k-means. Um, so first of all, it's um, such Gaussian mixture models are really good in representing complex distributed data. So if you have data samples and uh, you have no idea how you can estimate um, a good density from it, um, it's generally a good idea to assume a Gaussian mixture model as long as the number of Gaussians in the mixture is large enough. And uh, speaking of the number, um, you need to choose a suitable number of mixture components because if you do not choose enough, um, so if the, if the number is too, is too small, um, this uh, Gaussian distribution might not capture the, the structure and the distribution of the data in a uh, well enough. But if you choose too many of these mixture components, you, um, uh, you might also model the data in it. And this is nothing you want. Then um, when you compare expectation maximization with k-means, you realize that with expectation maximization algorithm, you uh, uh, compute more parameters. That means it's more computationally expensive. 
And also, uh, it mostly converges uh, slower than k-means algorithm. Both of these algorithms uh, depend on initialization, but you can use k-means uh, um, for initialization of EM algorithm. So how, we, uh, how you can do this? Uh, first of all, you run k-means uh, several times and uh, you will get slightly different results. And you can take uh, from all these results the best results, um, for example, um, by choosing um, the result where the lowest sum of all, where you have the lowest sum um, of all distances to the means. And then you use this for the initialization by taking the means obtained from the k-means algorithm and use uh, these means as the initialized means for EM algorithm. Um, then you take the clusters from k-means and uh, compute the covariance matrices from it. For the mixture components, you can just assume um, the same value or you derive it also from the clusters. And yeah, that's it. Uh, so you, uh, if you do it like this, you take the fast k-means algorithm and uh, to get a good initialization, so you have a very, um, uh, you ensure a fast convergence of EM algorithm. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, this uh, density estimation and how it can be performed. And as I mentioned in one of the last lectures, um, we have parametric methods and non-parametric methods. So parametric methods are when you estimate the density with a specific functional form uh, in a limited amount of parameters, for example, a Gaussian distribution. And this is what I showed you on the last slide. Um, so you assume you have a fixed number of parameters and that's it. Uh, for non-parametric methods, you estimate the density um, with only a few assumptions. So you do not assume you have a specific uh, distributed data, a specific distribution. So you do also not have a fixed number of parameters and um, it's good because you do not need to make any assumption, but uh, the disadvantage is that you usually, um, it usually grows with the number of the data points. Um, so if you have a lot of data points, uh, you, the non-parametric methods also have a lot of parameters. And, uh, an example for this is nearest neighbor. So when we performed nearest neighbor classification um, in the training process, that our density was just the training samples. And I want to talk a little bit more about these non-parametric methods. And uh, one of the simplest ways to compute the density is to have a look at the neighbors. And when you think about it, it makes sense because uh, if you have a lot of neighbors, uh, it's a very dense region. And if you do not have so many neighbors, it's a, a yeah, low density region. So the number of points which are there is, uh, uh, is an indicator for the density. And uh, to put this into an equation, um, you, can, uh, you can do it like this. Um, so you want to compute the density a value of one sample uh, given all samples. So n is the index for the one sample. And uh, this phi matrix is uh, the matrix of all data samples. And then um, you have um, n, uh, this nr is the number of samples in a region. And the region is the neighborhood. And this neighborhood can be defined by, um, yeah, uh, a hypersphere or a hypercube or some something um, yeah it's uh, uh, it depends what you uh, what you want to choose then you have the volume of the region and n is the number of samples and now you have two possibilities to actually compute the density uh, what you can do is you can fix nr so that means you uh, you fix the number of samples in a region and here the question is how large is the volume? So how, uh, how large is this hypercube or this hypersphere to have a specific amount of points in it? The other way is when you, um, uh, you fix the volume uh, and then uh, the question is, is how many samples are in the volume? 
if you uh, fix the, um, the number of points, uh, you have a nearest neighbor algorithm. And if you have, um, or one example is for this a nearest neighbor classifier. Uh, and if you fix the volume, uh, it's called kernel density estimation. And I would talk about this kernel density estimation in some specific cases uh, in, yeah, in the next slides. So let's start for, um, very easy with uh, one-dimensional um, features. So we have one-dimensional feature vectors and what we can do is we can divide the feature space into uniform bins uh, where the bin size is delta and then you estimate the density based on how many data is in the bins and this is exactly a histogram. Uh, and the idea is uh, behind it, the larger the number of feature vectors in the bin, the larger is the density uh, function value. So, and this is um, when you remember from the last lecture, I showed you this um, one dimensional feature space um, where we have these two classes of arable land and desert. And uh, when I plotted the histogram, that was exactly, uh, yeah, it already looked like some kind of density. Um, so what you need to define is the, the bin size. So this is called uh, the, so this is the hyperparameter you need to choose. And um, then uh, the density in each bin can be computed that you take uh, the number of feature vectors in the bin and you divide it by the overall sample numbers and um, yeah, the, uh, the size of the bin. Uh, this, uh, the size can be the same or you can also use different sizes um, for, for each bin. And uh, when you have the histogram in the end, you can perform a normalization to an area of one and then you can actually speak about the probability density function. So this is a quite easy sample uh, example when you have uh, one dimensional feature vectors and let me give you an example. Um, here you can see various histograms derived from 50 sampled uh, feature vectors. Um, so let's first have a look at the green curve. The, uh, the green curve is the uh, true distribution. Of course, we don't know this true distribution, but uh, let's assume uh, from this uh, true distribution, which is um, a Gaussian mixture with two components, there from there were uh, points sampled and this is what you get and from this you estimate uh, a density. And if you have a look at the top uh, plot, uh, you have a, a lot of peaks, so the bin size is quite small, um, but you also have empty bins and empty bins uh, might be a problem for further computations. If you look at the uh, bottom, uh, plot, you see this is way too imprecise, so, so one does not get the bimodal nature uh, of the distribution. Um, so it's, as I said before, the, uh, it's always crucial to find good hyperparameters, in this case, um, yeah, the size of the bin, uh, not too small, not too large. Um, the good thing uh, about these uh, histograms is that all feature vectors can be discarded as soon as the density is estimated. Um, so this is an advantage over approaches such as nearest neighbor where you always need to keep the samples. Um, but still it can be um, quite computation intense uh, when you have a lot of uh, features. It's suitable for sequential learning Sequential learning means once you have computed a histogram and you threw away and you discarded all the uh, samples, uh, you can update the histogram without recomputing everything from scratch. So you just update the histogram given a new data sample. Um, yeah, the optimal size of the bins is difficult to determine, um, but it's essential for a good result. And if you generalize this whole concept, uh, it's called kernel density estimation. And the kernel is, in this case, a bin. And uh, now we were talking about one uh, dimensional uh, data. Let's go to two dimensional data. 
and or even more dimensions. So um, when we use cubes um, or uh, rectangles, um, we talk about passing window. So passing windows is uh, uh, the approach called when you have a, a kernel density estimation with hypercubes around each sample. So in 1D, it would be just um, yeah, uh, an area and in 2D, it's a rectangle and in 3D, it's a hypercube. And this hypercube has a, a length of uh, delta and the volume of delta to the power of D, where D is the dimension. So this can be uh, used for arbitrary uh, dimensions. And so uh, how do you perform now the density estimation? Um, first of all, you take uh, these cubes and you center these cubes on each feature vector such that um, yeah, the, the uh, feature vector phi n is exactly in the middle of the cube. And then you count the samples that fall into the cube. And um, if you um, perform it for this example, like here, I, I did it for three samples. So for one sample, you have two points in the cube and for another it's six samples and for the uh, other one is 14 and there's always one point uh, uh, in the middle, one feature vector. And because you center the cube uh, on each feature vector, uh, the used index of R is the same now as the index of N. So the, the index R is for the region and uh, the index N is for the sample, so it's, uh, it's the same. And uh, yeah, the density can be computed by taking uh, this region or the, the, the number of samples uh, which are in the region. Then you take uh, all samples, number of all samples and uh, delta square because you have two dimensions and this is the volume. Um, you can generalize it uh, to kernel density estimation. Kernel density estimation is the general uh, umbrella term for um, when you use some kind of kernel and you perform a density estimation, as the name says. Um, and so for now, I uh, showed uh, the whole density estimation process I showed you for cubes and bins. But uh, you can formulate a very general kernel function. And a kernel function is a function which gives you a value how similar neighboring samples as uh, uh, how similar uh, these neighboring samples are uh, to a considered sample. And um, for this, we can of this example here, let's have a look at two, at two samples, phi n and phi m. Um, so the cube is centered around the, uh, the phi n, you have a rectangle, and there's one neighboring sample phi m. And if you, uh, you can formulate this passing window um, uh, as such a kernel function, and the kernel function is then uh, illustrated here. It has two cases. Um, this equation says nothing else. It's one for each, if each dimension d, if the distance between this, uh, these two samples is less than half of the side length. So um, that means if you, um, um, if you go in each direction uh, and uh, because the phi n is centered in the middle, if, you, if the distance is larger than half of the side length, it's outside of this, um, uh, this uh, hypercube, this rectangle. So it um, yeah, would be not be in the neighborhood anymore and then it would count as zero. If you do this for um, the, computer, uh, uh, the complete number of samples in the hypercube, it would look like this. So you apply the kernel function, you compute, um, uh, you compute it for all samples around it, um, for all other samples in, in the data set uh, with the given side length delta, and then you, um, yeah, compute it. Uh, you sum it over all samples m. And the nice uh, thing is that uh, you can use uh, any kind of kernel function which you want, uh, what you want to do. 
um, a very common one is the Gaussian kernel function. And uh, here again is the comparison between these uh, kernel functions. Um, if you use hypercubes, it's called Parson windows. And uh, if you um, make it more general with the kernel function, uh, it's the equation in the middle. So in the end, the structure of the equation is the same. And yeah, you can um, think of different kind of kernels. And as I said, the Gaussian kernel is a good choice. And it's, uh, it has another parameter, which is the uh, uh, sigma. So that you can, uh, uh, so that you know um, how uh, uh, how neighbors are weighted, and how you can compute the similarity between neighboring samples. Okay, let's have a look at um, uh, an example with uh, where various Gaussian uh, kernel density models are uh, compared. Again, uh, it's this green true distribution and from this true distribution, 50 samples uh, were derived. And um, then we centered a Gaussian kernel on it, on each uh, of each of these samples. And on, in the top row, you can see that you have a very small sigma, so a very uh, um, yeah, thin Gaussian distribution and you see a lot of peaks. And uh, on the, in the bottom is uh, when you have a large sigma, so um, uh, nearly all samples have a huge influence on the density estimation. And again, the bimodal structure of the, um, uh, of the dis distribution cannot be captured if the sigma is too large. So as I said, as always, uh, think about which parameters you choose and uh, not too small, not too, uh, not too large. Otherwise, uh, you will not be satisfied with the result. And um, when, if you would have enough data samples uh, and with enough, I mean, uh, an infinite amount of samples, which is never the case, um, you would actually be able to uh, estimate uh, the true underlying density. But you will never have an infinite number of samples given. So what you can do is uh, you all, always only get an approximation of, about, uh, of the true underlying density. And you can do it as good as possible. And um, yeah, and for this, you need to know about which distribution uh, you assume. Uh, or when you use um, a non-parametric method, you need to think about some hyperparameters or um, maybe also which kernel you want to use. And as a reminder, um, um, so nearest neighbor analysis can also be used directly for a posteriori estimation. And here I want to uh, give you the bridge between what I told you in the last slides about how you can use, uh, how you can perform density estimation. And this is the same procedure as you used, uh, um, um, or what I told you in the um, first lecture or second lecture about the uh, nearest neighbor classifier and how you can perform an a posteriori estimation. So based, uh, for example, if you want to uh, assign a point to uh, a class, you um, look at the training data around it and just count how often uh, a specific class data occurs in the neighborhood. And from this, you could derive a uh, posterior probability. So you see, with the same techniques, you can um, perform um, a lot of different tasks. And this is exactly what I also want to sh uh, show you here with this slide or what you, this is uh, also my take home message from the, the, which I want to give you for the whole course, um, that uh, you have a lot of tools now, which you can use for a, a huge variety of tasks you can solve with it. And as an example, um, so where do we need density estimation? It's uh, not only that uh, you uh, can define a likelihood function for maximum likelihood classifier or maximum a posteriori estimation. Um, you can also use it for clustering. Uh, 
Um, so expectation maximization algorithm can, can be used for clustering and cl uh, clustering is nothing else than finding areas with a high density. And areas with a low density are good for decision boundaries or the area between two clusters. Um, and uh, yeah, if you if you prefer, uh, if you uh, use clustering for image segmentation, um, you also have now um, uh, the the bridge to from density estimation to image segmentation. And then for dimensionality reduction, I uh, already told you in within the first few slides. Um, what I told you uh, when I told you about the covariance matrix and the ellipses. And this idea is used for principal component analysis. So you analyze where the directions of the largest spread are. And these are used as the axis uh, of the lower dimensional feature space. In general, density estimation can be used for pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is a huge research area, very interesting. Um, and pattern recognition is the automatic recognition of patterns and regularities in the data. That means if, um, uh, if features uh, cluster together, uh, then there might be a pattern. So high, high density areas uh, um, might be an indicator for, for patterns in the feature space. And you can estimate the densities uh, for intensities, but you can also estimate uh, densities for texture features or even more complex features, uh, which can be derived, for example, from neural networks. Um, and, but the idea is always the same. Uh, you, so you try to find high density uh, areas for these features and these areas uh, are assigned as uh, this pattern or there's something which is shared by a lot of samples. So, um, just to give you uh, some, some strings and some relations between all these uh, areas uh, I was talking about in the, uh, in the last, um, yeah, uh, last few weeks. And with this, I want to conclude. So density estimation is needed in many, many areas for analysis and interpretation. And, but be careful with high dimensions. Um, of, uh, I'm, um, uh, I named it, uh, the, uh, not I named it, but it's named the curse of uh, dimensionality. So be careful with the high dimensions. For pass and window, it's uh, the number of bin increases exponentially. So as soon as you, if you go to higher dimensions and uh, you uh, want to compute the density with hypercubes, the number of hypercubes of the, um, with the same uh, side length grows exponentially. Then kernel functions behave different in, in high dimensions. This is what I told you about the melon. Um, uh, that uh, if you compute uh, something like uh, distances in high dimensions, it behaves differently than in lower dimensional spaces. And the identification of the density, which described the uh, data, is facilitated by the choice of suitable features. And here you get the bridge to uh, the feature extraction. So if you choose suitable features, it's much, much easier to uh, um, estimate a good density. So if you um, already um, found uh, features which uh, cluster together in feature space, it's much easier to uh, uh, find this cluster and to compute the density. So that was the last lecture in the course. I hope I could teach you some basics in uh, image analysis and machine learning, and I hope you are also interested in uh, my other courses. Thanks a lot for the intention and uh, see you soon.